To collect photographs is to collect the world. Photography is often called the universal hobby. It is a means of creative expression within the reach of people in all walks of life. The world always seems so much better in pictures. Every now and then, my friends and I would stay up at night forwarding each other photos from a trip to Cambodia just two summers ago, when we traveled around the temples on tuk-tuks during the day and hopping between rooftop bars with the brightest neon lights and the loudest American pop music from the 2000s. It is easy to dwell in our wells of nostalgia, but there is a certain kind of sensibility that's not quite there in the pictures. An Instagram readiness that makes them more than what they really are. And to top it up with a sapia or a 1977 filter that yellows the photos and a square white border reminiscent of a Polaroid, this gives something just a millisecond old, a texture of time. In exactly the year of 1977, two years right after the end of the Vietnam War, a sharp-tongued philosopher by the name of Susan Sontag put this lack of visual meanings into words, calling people over time image junkies. We have a notion about a photograph. You see, we want photographs to tell us the truth, and we value them because they really are records in a sense, let's say the painting is, and at the same time we want photographs to lie. We want them to make us look good, that is to say better than we normally look. Just like the cavemen in Plato's allegory, who are chained to a rock since birth, only to see shadows cast on the wall and mistake them as the real objects. We are now glued to our phones, mistaking photographs as the ultimate truth. Sontag called the never-ending photo album we are so accustomed to these days a portrait chronicle, and the Instagrammable cave we are so comfortable in, an image world. Susan Sontag was born into a Jewish, middle-class family in New York City. And from a very young age, she buried herself in books, studied philosophy and literature in the best schools in the world, and lived a quite scandalous yet glamorous life. She was well-loved by many. And we started making out together. And she was wild. As she became the literary star of the city and a feminist icon. I don't like being called a lady writer, Norman. I know it does it seems like gallantry to you, but it it doesn't feel right to us. Yeah, I mean, you, if you were introducing James Baldwin, you wouldn't say our foremost Negro writer. Don't take shit. Tell the bastards off. She spoke French fluently. Un écrivain, c'est un peu tout faire. Star in new wave movies and was photographed by a little nobody named Andy Warhol. As a cultural critic, her philosophical ideas are still influencing culture today. Susan Sontag says in her notes on camp that camp is a way of seeing the world as an aesthetic phenomenon. Yeah. One that rests on innocence. And that innocence, which is revealed by the person, thing, performance, or otherwise, arrives in extravagance. Camp is serious in its attitude, and in its irony, it is ultimately anti-serious. Camp notes on fashion. The idea of drag is camp because we're saying, you know, um, I'm not this body, I'm actually, I'm actually God in drag playing humanity. She has become synonymous with who we think the high society is and should be. But the novels of Susan Sontag are self-indulgent, overrated crap. I believe in long, slow, deep, soft, wet kisses that last three days. And I think Susan Sontag is brilliant. But she knew that there's more to these worldly appearances. She studied films closely and was deeply entranced by the power of the medium. She knew that there's always a shady transaction between art and truth as she made her case in her book on photography in 1977. Pretty much since the invention of daguerreotype in 1839, we as a society have developed an insatiable appetite for photographs as we slowly learned the grammar of our way of seeing. 
It is a way of us trying to possess the past, and in doing so, gaining pleasure from it. We use photography to capture reality, provide evidence, entertain the living, and immortalize the dead. Photography went naturally with family life as each family began to build a portrait chronicle to memorialize its connectedness and continuity of a bloodline. So when amateur photography was popularized by a Kodak's box camera called Brownie in 1900, this affordable point-and-shoot memory-making machine quickly revolutionized the usage of photography. Photography was then developed alongside one of our most defining modern activities: tourism. For the first time in history. Large numbers of people were able to travel regularly out of their usual environments for short periods of time. Hello there. We are taking you aboard the Boeing Jet Stratoliner, the 707, to give you a preview of airliner travel of the future. Because our first commercial liners are not ready as yet, this will have to be partly make believe. We might call it a flight into tomorrow. And people can document the trips they made and the fun they had with a portable camera. And because of the almost indisputable nature offered in photography, taking pictures has fulfilled the needs of the cosmopolitans in collecting photographed trophies. It's the easiest way I know to bring home the whole zoo. We don't really understand anything from photographs, Sontag argues. We hunt for what is photogenic, shocking, and worthy of news. It is what Sontag, who lived in the age of the Vietnam War, was worried about. Our sense of the world is now ruled and shaped by photographed images. What was the first photograph you saw that shocked and horrified you? Does it still horrify you? I think the overall effect of photographs, of painful, terrible photographs, is that one is less shocked. I think that when you see a lot of very shocking and painful photographs, you flinch less. It is an irresistible form of mental pollution, and in a consumer society, there will always be more violent and more obscene photos for us to consume. We turned ourselves into the cavemen who couldn't tell the shadows and the real objects apart. It is obviously natural for the shadows or the images to possess the qualities of the real objects. But it is disconcerting, to say the least, for people to start grafting the qualities of an image onto real objects. We have art museums today that feel pressured to be Instagrammable to attract visitors. We have food that tastes the same as the original, regularly priced higher because of its Instagrammability. We curate our lives to fit nicely into a narrative, or rather, an Instagram story. The image world encroaches and replaces the real world. Malarmi said that everything in the world exists in order to end in a paragraph. Today, everything exists to end in a photograph.